Okay, we're going to be looking at problem number 28 from chapter 10 on number 548. This problem is involving a poll about Americans and whether or not they uh, support the draft. The first thing we always need to look at is whether uh, we're looking at means or proportions. In this case, we're looking at proportions, so I'm going to set my parameter as P equals, uh, since P is the uh, number of proportions, and um, P equals the true uh, proportion of U.S. adults who oppose uh, reinstating the draft, or I'm just going to put who opposed the draft. And then once you have that, it's time for a null and an alternate hypothesis. So your null hypothesis, in this case, we can denote with an H sub zero, if I can get my subscript to cooperate. Your null hypothesis is going, is going to be that the proportion, which I can denote with a P, is equal to uh, two-thirds. Null hypothesis always has an equal to, uh, so that's something that's very consistent about your null hypothesis. And then uh, your alternate hypothesis will often be based on the claim. So in this case, my claim is that over two-thirds uh, pose the draft, so that's why I'm going to go with a greater than. Now, this greater than two-thirds is going to mean that this is going to be a one-tailed test. And we'll sketch what the distribution looks like in just a minute. Now, the assumptions I need to go through. I need to be sure that I have a always in any kind of uh, test or confidence interval. We need to be sure we don't have bias, which means we're looking for a random sample. So, in this case, uh, it is given that we have a random sample. of U.S. adults uh, when we're dealing with proportions and it's a survey we're sampling without replacement so it's important that we don't oversample so I'm going to say that clearly the uh, 1,000 adults is less than 10% uh, of all U.S. adults basically as long as I stay under 10% of my population it's going to make it close enough to normally, uh, it's going to make it close enough to independent so that my p-values remain constant uh, throughout the length of the survey. And uh, if it didn't, if it went over that 10%, I basically would not have independent p-values, and uh, I would have uh, to use some very different methods. The next uh, condition I always need to check is to see if it's sufficiently large. So that's going to be to confirm that n times p is greater than 10, and that. Uh, n times uh, 1 minus p is uh, greater than or equal to 10. You do need to write out the formula, then we need to set the substitution into it. So in this case, 1,000 times 2 thirds, uh, and that would be 1,000 times 1 third for 1 minus p. I notice I'm using my p value uh, that I've hypothesized. I'm not given the actual p value, but in place of it, it's perfectly acceptable to use the hypothesized p-value. Do not use your sample uh, p-value um, when you're doing these hypothesis tests. Use the hypothesized p-value instead. So that gives me roughly a 667 on this side, which is definitely greater than 10. And then on the other side, it gives me uh, 333, which is also way greater than 10. So I can say, so my sample is sufficiently a reminder, today's large. schedule includes the reason for testing for the size of my sampling distribution um, to test that it's sufficiently large is to know if the sampling distribution of my sample proportion is approximately normal. If uh, it wasn't sufficiently large, I would be stuck using binomial probability, which is a lot more tedious with the hypothesis test. The next thing we're going to have to work with is um, going to now have to name the test we're using. So the test we're using is a uh, large sample, since we've showed the sample is sufficiently large. Uh, name what statistic we're using, z-test, for uh, population proportion. Uh, always, when you're naming a test, tell what you're looking for, in this case the fact it's a large sample, what test statistic you're using, in this case it's z, and then what you're actually testing for, which is the population proportions. Okay, then as we go on, it's time to list our test statistics. So my n value is 1,000. Uh, my p hat is... A p hat is my sample proportion, which in this case is uh, 700 out of 1,000. 
which equals uh, just 0 0.7. If that's an ugly decimal, I would leave it as the fraction, but in that case, it's a nice pretty decimal, so the decimal's uh, a little bit cleaner. You can go either way, a reduced fraction or a decimal there. And then that's your alpha value, which is your significance level. This alpha value, my significance level, is the probability of making a type 1 error. So basically you get to choose how likely you are to make a type 1 error or basically how likely you are to um, reject the null hypothesis when it is actually correct. That's your type 1 error probability that you basically set for the problem. This is a good place to list your alpha value. Now once you've done that, you're ready to find a p-value. So we're looking for, in this case, the probability that uh, my p-hat is uh, greater than the uh, 0 0.7. The reason I'm doing the greater than is because um, that's what the ultimate hypothesis is. The inequality you use on this t-test is always linked to whatever is uh, used in your alternate hypothesis. So since we were testing for a greater than in my alternate hypothesis, that's what I do when I find the p-value. Now I need to change this uh, p-hat into a z-score so I'm looking for the probability that z is greater than or equal to, and I'm just going to type it in this way, um, my, test statistic, um, my test statistic, which in this case is my p-hat, 0.7, minus my, hypothesis, my parameter, which in this case is hypothesized to be two-thirds, divided by the standard deviation of my statistic. Now, when we... Uh, finish this out with the denominator, what I have done is I've done the um, standard deviation of my uh, proportion. That formula is found on your formula sheet. It's P, which is your hypothesized P again of two-thirds, times one minus P, which is one-third, over a thousand, all of it in the square root. That is your standard deviation that you can use to get your z-score. Two is I'm ready to put this z-score in the calculator, so I'm going to do 0 0.7 minus two-thirds and that's going to give me my numerator for my z-score. I usually do the denominator separately, so I'm going to do the square root of two-thirds times one-third and then divided by a thousand. You could have made it a pretty fraction, but it'll work like that. There's your denominator. That denominator is the, also the standard deviation of your proportion. That means we expect uh, to be off by about 0 .004 or about 0.4% is how much we expect to be off by. Actually, correcting it, that gives you 1,000. That give you, that's a more reasonable thing. I was wondering why that was so small. So that means you're off by about 1.4% is how much you would typically be off from one sample from your true value. So, you know, you think I'm going to be off about 1.5% from my true value. Now, to get your z-score, I need to take that numerator, which is on this top line of how much I'm actually off there, divided by this denominator, how much I expect to be off, my standard deviation of p-hat, and that gives me a z-score of 2.236. Now, I'm looking for the probability that z is greater than or equal to that amount. Actually, there's no difference. Once I get that z value, what I'm looking at here is probably that I have a uh, normal distribution. So this normal distribution would be assuming a center at my hypothesized value of two-thirds. And we said we were off by about one and a half percent, so that means if I'm centered around two-thirds, the amount I expect to be off by would be 1.5%, so that would be about 0.68. So this 0.7 value I have here is way on out here, and the p-value I'm talking about is the probability of being more than two standard deviations, or more than 0.7 as a sample proportion. And you can tell right there we're looking for a pretty small proportion. So what we can do is we can use the calculator to find this exact value. It's going to be relatively small. So when we go to the calculator, we can do second distribution. I can do normal CDF because I have a z-score and I need a probability. I'm going to start at the 2.23, uh, which is my previous answer. I'm going to go to a really big number. Since I'm dealing with z-scores, I leave mean and standard deviation alone. I press enter, and it tells me that my p-value is uh, 0 0.01. So this number here right here is my p-value. Now this p-value is the probability of getting a result like this assuming my null hypothesis.
hypothesis is correct. So in other words, if, my, if this distribution really is centered about two-thirds, if that really is the population proportion, I only have about a 1% chance of being that far, at least that far off. Any questions so far? Finish it up. You do the conclusion in context, so we're going to say since my p-value of 0 0.0127 is less than my alpha of 0 0.05, I'm just going to paste that in. What am I going to do, reject or fail to reject? I'm going to reject my null hypothesis. This means <coughs> we find statistically significant evidence. When you reject your null hypothesis, that's when you find statistically significant evidence that the uh, true proportion, put it in context, of U.S. adults opposed to the draft is uh, greater than two-thirds. Basically, I'm just stating my alternate hypothesis because when I reject my null hypothesis, I'm left with my alternate hypothesis. Any questions?